the parotid gland, the architects of oral moisture. When we spoke about the submandibular gland, we pointed out how it was a consistent chess player, always making smart moves even in a resting state. We called it the grandmaster, or should I say, glandmaster of saliva production, accounting for a whopping 70% of saliva at rest. But wait, we also mentioned a chess prodigy who brought the best game ever during a tournament, quickly giving the other glands a run for their money. Oh yes, we are talking about the parotid gland. When stimulated by tasty foods, the parotid gland takes centre stage and contributes 50% of the saliva production, removing the submandibular gland from the top of the score chart. Here's a fun fact. Did you know that there are between 600 to 1000 minor salivary glands in your mouth? These little guys are nameless for the most part, except for a few named glands like the molar, palatine, labial, buccal and lingual glands. Unlike the major salivary glands, they don't have a protective capsule and they either share duct systems with adjacent salivary glands or have their own. But hey, they may be small and nameless, but they are definitely doing their part to keep your mouth moist and happy. Today we'll be diving into the details of the largest salivary gland in our bodies, the parotid gland. Let's begin with its tough personal bodyguard, the capsule. The parotid gland is encased in a fibrous capsule called the parotid capsule, which is formed by the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. The fascia splits in the region between the mastoid process and the mandibular angle to encapsulate the gland. It's like the gland is getting a big bear hug from its tough but loving bodyguard. The capsule has a superficial lamina, which is especially strong and adherent to the gland and blends with the epimyceum of the masseter to form a thick parotid masseteric fascia. The deep lamina presents a thickening called the stylomandibular ligament, which separates the parotid gland from the submandibular gland. It's as if the parotid gland is telling the submandibular gland to respect its personal space. Let's now learn about its gross anatomy. Each individual is gifted with a pair of parotid glands that are situated in the pre-auricular area on each side of the face. It is the largest of the three major salivary glands, the others being the submandibular and sublingual glands. Each gland is irregular, consisting of a superficial and a deep lobe, and is tan yellow in appearance. Although the parotid gland is the tress prodigy nobody can defeat, it is also a friendly, squishy gland that likes to socialize with its competition. It stretches from the external auditory meatus all the way down to the upper part of the carotid triangle. It overlaps with the sternocleidomastoid muscle and extends over the masseter for a variable distance. Occasionally, the gland also has a special friend, an accessory parotid gland that hangs out between the zygomatic arch and the parotid duct. Now, the parotid duct is described as being irregular in shape, but its general outline is that of an inverted pyramid. The base is the most superior part of the gland, while the blunt apex points inferiorly. It also has anterior medial, posterior medial, and superficial surfaces. Neat mania. Let's pause to answer this question, shall we? What is the location of the parotid gland? One between the ramus of the mandible and the buccinator. 2. Between the ramus of the mandible and sternocleidomastoid. 3. Between the ramus of the mandible and masseter. 4. Between the ramus of the mandible and medial pterygoid. Answer 2. Back to the session now, let's discuss the parts of the gland. Starting from the top, the apex projects downward and overlaps the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and the adjoining part of the carotid triangle. Through this surface, the cervical branch of the facial nerve and posterior divisions of the retromandibular vein emerge. The base is concave and related to the external acoustic meatus and the posterior aspect of the temporomandibular joint. The structures emerging through it are the superficial temporal vessels, the auriculotemporal nerve, 
and the temporal branch of the facial nerve. The largest surface is the superficial surface. It is covered from superficial to deep by skin. Superficial fascia containing anterior branches of the greater auricular nerve, the platysma muscle and parotid fascia. Moving on to the anteromedial surface, it presents a groove formed by the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible. It is related to the masseter, medial pterygoid muscle, posterior border of the ramus of the mandible and the temporomandibular joint. The branches of the facial nerve emerge on the face from underneath the anterior margin of this surface. The posterior medial surface is related to the mastoid process, sternocleidomastoid muscle, posterior belly of digastric muscle, and the styloid process, along with the muscles attached to it. The trunk of the facial nerve and the external carotid artery enter the gland through this surface. Let's move on to the borders of the gland. The anterior border separates the superficial surface from the anteromedial surface. Underneath this border, various structures emerge in a radiating fashion, which includes the temporal branch of the facial nerve, the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve, transverse facial vessels, and the upper buccal branch of the facial nerve. Then comes the parotid duct itself, below which we have the lower buccal and the marginal mandibular branches of the facial nerve. The posterior border separates the superficial surface from the posterior medial surface. Underneath this border, the posterior auricular vessels and the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve emerge. Let's pause for another neat mania question. Which of the following does not form a border of the parotid gland? 1. The zygomatic arch. 2. The external acoustic meatus. 3. The mastoid process. 4. The great auricular nerve. 5. The masseter muscle. Correct answer 4. Next, we move on to the structures present within the parotid gland. The parotid gland has three main structures that either in part or in whole traverse the gland and branch within it. From superficial to deep, these structures are the facial nerve, the retromandibular vein, and the external carotid artery. The facial nerve is the most superficial of the three and enters the gland through the upper part of the posterior medial surface. It then divides into its smaller terminal branches inside the gland. These branches travel horizontally, leave the gland through its anterior medial surface, and appear on the face by passing underneath its anterior border. The five terminal branches then spread out like a goose foot and supply the muscles of facial expression. The retromandibular vein is in the intermediate zone of the gland and it is formed by the union of the superficial temporal and maxillary veins. It ends below by dividing into two parts. The anterior division joins with the facial vein to form the common facial vein, while the posterior division joins with the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein. Finally, the external carotid artery pierces the lower part of the posterior medial surface to enter the gland, where it occupies the deep zone of the gland. It then splits into the superficial temporal and maxillary arteries within the gland. Let's learn about Patty's facio-venous plane. The parotid gland is divided into large superficial and small deep parts or lobes connected by an isthmus of the glandular tissue. The branches of the facial nerve pass forward through the isthmus. Between the superficial and deep lobes is the facial venous plane, named after the famous surgeon Patty, and is where nerves and veins like to hang out. This plane helps the surgeons to remove the parotid tumour without damaging the nerve. Time for another session of Neat Mania. Which of the following structures is the deepest in the parotid gland? 1. Facial nerve 2. Retromandibular vein 3. External carotid artery 4. Superficial temporal artery Answer. External carotid artery Did you get it right? Great memory if you did! Let's learn about the vascular supply of the parotid gland. 
The arterial supply of the parotid gland primarily comes from branches of the external carotid artery, which is a major vessel supplying blood to the head and neck. The superficial temporal artery is one of the terminal branches of the external carotid artery. It courses along the side of the head, running superficially just above the ear, and gives off smaller branches that supply blood to the parotid gland. The maxillary artery is the other terminal branch of the external carotid artery. It travels deeper into the head and neck region. Within the parotid gland, it gives rise to its terminal branches, known as the transverse facial artery, which contributes to the blood supply of the parotid gland. The rich blood supply to the parotid gland is crucial for maintaining its metabolic processes and ensuring proper secretion of saliva. It's important to note that disruptions in blood supply, such as during surgical procedures or certain medical conditions, can impact the function and health of the gland. The veins of the parotid gland carry deoxygenated blood and metabolic waste away from the gland. The posterior division of the retromandibular vein drains most of the gland. Eventually, they drain into the external jugular vein, which travels down the neck to drain into the subclavian vein. Let's move on to the lymphatic drainage. The lymph nodes of the parotid gland are distributed throughout the superficial and deep lobes of the gland and drain into the jugulodigastric group of nodes. And now the nerve supply. The parotid gland is under the control of the parasympathetic nervous system, which communicates with the gland via the lesser petrosal nerve. This nerve is a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve also known as cranial nerve 9, with synapses on the otic ganglion. From there, the postganglionic secretomotor fibers emerge and reach the parotid gland via the auriculotemporal nerve. This nerve is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, also known as cranial nerve 5. The sympathetic supply to the parotid gland is derived from the adjacent sympathetic plexus of the carotid sheath. The auriculotemporal nerve is responsible for carrying general sensations from the gland. Let us now move on to the clinical conditions affecting the parotid gland. One interesting condition is Frey's syndrome, also known as auriculotemporal nerve syndrome, which is like a twisted game of telephone played by your nerves. Sometimes, when the parotid gland gets injured, the penetrating wounds can damage the auriculotemporal and great auricular nerves. During the nerve regeneration process, the parasympathetic, sensory and sympathetic fibers of the auriculotemporal nerve and the fibers of the great auricular nerve start growing back in all the wrong places. It's like trying to rebuild a house with mismatched Lego pieces. It might work, but it'll be a bit wonky. So when someone with Frey syndrome eats, their cheek on the same side as the damaged nerve starts blushing, gets hot and painful, and beads of perspiration start forming. Neat mania time again. Here's another question to test your knowledge. All of the following structures are passing through the parotid gland, except 1. External carotid artery 2. Retromandibular vein 3. Facial vein 4. Internal carotid artery Answer 4. Now what is the point of all that glandular power and all that awesome saliva if there's no way to transport it to its destination? Well, that's what the parotid duct is for. Two major ducts arise from the parotid gland, unite within the substance of the organ to form the parotid duct of Stenson. The parotid duct is roughly 7 cm by 3 mm long and leaves the superior part of the anteromedial surface of the gland. It passes horizontally over the surface of the masseter muscle, then courses medially towards its anterior border. The duct then makes an abrupt right turn to cross the buccinator muscle and associated buccal fad pad. The parotid duct has a short submucosal course beginning at the crown of the upper third molar then anteriorly and obliquely towards the upper second molar. The duct will eventually pierce the buccal mucosa to enter the oral cavity via a papilla adjacent to the upper second molar. The aforementioned submucosal course provides a valvular mechanism to prevent the reflux of air into the gland during instances of raised intraoral pressure, for example, 
while blowing out the cheeks. There are several clinical conditions involving the parotid gland. Let's discuss a few. The parotid duct, which lies one finger's breadth below the zygomatic arch, is actually a bit of a troublemaker. It tends to roll up and down against the tense masseter muscle when we clench our teeth, making it vulnerable to injury. Parotitis refers to the inflammation of the parotid gland. It can be caused by viral infections, such as mumps or bacterial infections. Symptoms often include pain, swelling and tenderness in the area around the ear and jaw. In severe cases, abscess formation can occur. Salivary stones or sialolithiasis are calcified deposits that can develop within the ducts of the parotid gland or other salivary glands. These stones can block the flow of saliva, leading to pain and swelling during mealtimes. The condition may require removal of the stone or other interventions. Shorgen's syndrome is an autoimmune disorder that primarily affects the salivary and lacrimal glands, leading to dry mouth and dry eyes. The parotid gland can be significantly affected, resulting in reduced saliva production and increased risk of dental problems. In the event of a serious infection, it may become necessary to drain the infected area. To do this, the preferred method is to make a horizontal incision in the parotid fascia. This method is called the Hilton's method. The most common type of benign tumor found in the parotid gland is the pleomorphic adenoma. Although benign, these tumors can grow and cause local symptoms such as a painless lump, facial weakness or discomfort. So there you have it. Everything you need to know about the largest salivary gland in the body. We hope you had fun learning with us.